Okay, it is 2 p.m., so we will call to order our regular meeting of council, and we will start by recognizing that we are holding our meeting on the unceded traditional territories of the Sishot and Hoopachesset First Nations. Um, we do have an agenda in front of us. Are there any late items to be added but from councillors? Seeing none, any late items from the corporate officer? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, seeing none. This is a notice that our me meeting is being video recorded and it, that it is live streamed on our YouTube page and on the city's website. We do recognize that there are a number of people in the audience today not wearing masks um, and it is a requirement while we're in this room that people do wear masks for um, everyone's safety in this room. We have a requirement to keep the members of the audience safe as well who may be seated next to someone who is not able to wear a mask. So, we respect that um, people have indicated they have medical exemptions. We want everyone to be able to participate in our meeting. But that said, um, the portion of our meeting that is for public participation is at the beginning and in public input period. We want everyone to be able to participate in that. And following that, we would request that everybody who is not able to wear a mask for medical reasons, um, please watch the meeting from home. You are able to do that um, on YouTube. So everybody has access, um, but once that public participation period wraps up, we would request that you watch from home. Um, would somebody like to move approval of our agenda? Second. Seconded by Councillor Solda, all in favor? Carried. Okay, and we have uh, minutes from the special meeting held at 9.30 and the regular meeting of council held at 2 p.m. on November 8th, 2021. Would somebody like to move adoption? Move to adopt. Moved by Councillor Solda. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried. And that brings us to public input period. Would any members of the public like to speak? Come on forward. And if you don't mind stating your name and address for the record, and we have three minutes for public input. City Councillors, my name is Cass Stoltz. I live in Port Alberni, and I'm addressing what's going on with our, our sports arenas, our rink. So I'll start with, um, we're living in a time of blind compliance and immense censorship while experiencing a lack of transparency from our governments. Many scientists and doctors and biologists are being heavily censored and these scientists and doctors' education, experience, and knowledge far exceed those of Bonnie Henry, Henry Adrian Dix, and company. Yet they are being slandered and censored by our media. In 2019, Justin Trudeau, Trudeau used 600 million Canadian dollars to um, give to the Canadian media and create the Trusted News Initiate. This corrupts our news and allows for great suppression of the real news. Last year's inoculations were brought forward under the emergency power, which was canceled on June 29th. And these, these, yeah, sorry, June 29th, 2020, and these are still being used. There, <clears throat> these are all experimental vaccines that test done on the animals, it killed all of them. Under Bill 12, Justin Trudeau, John Horgan, and Adrian Dix would be liable if they mandated anything that they're asking you to do. The Bill 12 absolves them and the government, who is really behind this, uh, for vaccine, jam vaccine, oh, sorry, vaccine damage. And, and Bill 12 leaves it up to City Hall school boards to make decisions how, on how they're going to manage their facilities. This leaves you each individually responsible and liable for every decision that you make on all matters regarding restrictions and coercion on your policies. Anyone with vaccine damage because of your action has the right to sue you, and B12 allows that. All Canadians are protect, protected under the Charter of Rights and only in emergency after legislative debate are our rights allowed to be suspended under law? And this has never happened. Mandates are completely dismiss the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The PCR test is being withdrawn as it's found to be unreliable. The CDC is taking that out of commission December 31st. Why they're waiting that long, I'll never know. 
So I'm also concerned about the order that allegedly was written by Bonnie Henry, and it does not give evidence to support that vaccines are safe and effective, and that it reduces the risk of infection. The vaccine companies themselves have Thank stated- Thank you very much for your input. The three minutes has oh, passed okay. now. Thank you. Anyhow, uh, what I'm going to say to you is be very careful with your decisions. Thank you. And when you segregate our population, through our sports and thank through you anything. i do have to cut you off we okay. only have three minutes for public input period okay and thank i hope you. you read the articles the letters and the information i gave you about a month ago thank you are there other members of the public who would like to come forward madam mayor and councillors Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Marie Lac Lacroix, and I'm in Port Alberni. So, uh, do I start? Okay, well, I was wondering, why does Port Alberni Council promote this illegal segregation of your town's taxpayers? Why is Port Alberni hindering the town's small businesses by dividing consumers who can or cannot enter an establishment? Why is Port Alberni Council dictating that businesses act as health passport enforcement officers? Why is Port Alberni Council putting unnecessary liability upon the taxpayers' establishments? Why did Port Alberni Council promote the illegal health passport to begin with? Port Alberni businesses have been suffering for years as tourism dollars pass by to flourish on the West Coast. How to keep the tourists in Port Alberni has been the ongoing question and now Council is promoting even further disadvantages for local businesses. Just because people do not wish to inject themselves with an experimental gene therapy inoculation that is commonly referred to as COVID-19 vaccine, you segregate that population. But really, what does it matter if a person is injected or not? It doesn't seem to matter when collecting their taxes or council going to credit the non-passport population on next year's, or wait, or is council going to credit the non-passport population on next year's city taxes? It is time to stop promoting this illegal segregation of the town's people. You have been served your notice of liability Hence, please note, apartheid is not welcomed in Canada. We do have the Canadian Bill of Rights and Freedom that protects Canadians against such acts. Imagine, though, without passports, perhaps tourism dollars would flourish as people would st state how wonderful it is to visit Port Alberni because of not, no illegal health passports. Maybe we would make some more money. Perhaps then tax monies collected would amount to more than what the Trudeau government gives you for apartheid purposes. But best of all, would the townspeople not celebrate you because you were fighting for them, not against them? If you look around town, the vacant storefronts are, pr are proof of how difficult you have made businesses succeed in staying alive. And why do you persist on making this town a ghost town it is not time to work with businesses and try to help. It is time to work, to work with businesses and try to help them. It's not time to stop this illegal. It is time to stop this illegal health passport game and work for us, the taxpayers, who pay you. your salary. Thank you. Very concerned citizen. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak? We have room for two more speakers. <coughs> Thanks for cleaning that. Uh, my name is Frank Dahl. I want to thank the mayor and council for giving me the opportunity to address uh, yourselves. Um, my family lived in Port Alberni over 70 years. We're taxpayers. I live presently in Port Alberni. And I'm concerned about what's going on around me. I'm sure you're concerned too. You wouldn't hold these positions unless you're people of truth. I believe that you're standing on what you believe is your own personal strong convictions as I do. I'm concerned also about the Vax Pass. Uh, I understand, you know, in some ways why they put it into place. And what concerns me is the Vax Pass in some ways doesn't apply to me because, first of all, I've acquired 
of COVID-19. I've overcome it. And uh, the doctor confirmed that my antibodies are up, so I can't spread it. Science, if you looked into it, tells me that I am absolutely 17 times better off than taking the shot. So here I am without a VAC pass. I can't go anywhere. It seems to me like there is a very strong discrimination in our society, in our country actually, and seemingly around the world. Here I am. I can't get a VAX pass. I can't go anywhere. Yet I'm fully immune to any virus. I, you can breathe on me all you want, and I won't be affected by it. Believe me, I'm very confident of that. The doctor confirms it. Science confirms it. But here I am. And yet, we have a very strong constitution. Actually, we have rights and freedoms. But I think really what has turned out to be is limitations and restrictions that is going on in our country. There is paranoia that is exponentially way out of this stratosphere. People are motivated by fear where this, I am a living testimony. Here I am 71 years old. I got the COVID-19 full on. Here I'm standing before you as a living testimony that this thing, in my estimation, has no different than the common flus I've had in my past years. We're living a lie, folks. We're totally living a big, big lie. It concerns me big time that, like watching a movie, you've got to buy into this lie. These actors, and that's what hypocrisy is, a big, fat lie. You've got to buy into the movie, and you get sold out. Wow, these people are great actors, but they're acting. But if you stood behind the acting, film being processed, you discovered Hey, you know, lights, camera, action, take two, take three, take ten. The movie doesn't have the same impact. Most people have bought in to the big lie. It is a lie. I've done a study since this thing has started, and it appalls me that people have bought into this thing, hook, line, and sinker. We have a two-tier society developing in our country. It's causing division between neighbors, friends, family, and who knows who else? What are we as council mayor going to do about it? Are we going to stand on our laurels? Or are we going to go on the history as saying, we're going to stand against this lie. We are going, not going to buy Thank into you. it. I do have to cut you off. We well, of only have three minutes in our, yep, our Yep, We have three minutes allowance in Thank our you. bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak today? No. Come on forward, Cheryl. <laughs> Yeah, I have a gift. I'll be the nice one out of the bunch, wherever the camera is. <laughs> oh, they were pretty heavy, hey? Um, I have a gift to bring um, to this city hall, actually, because you guys will come and go, right? So I can't give it to you, sorry. But what it is, is it's actually, it's a copy of the Canadian Charter of Freedom and Rights, and I even framed it. Isn't that great? So I thought that would be great to have to hang in our, in our hall. Oh, and um, so is that okay? don't know what to expect. Eh? So anyways, so the other thing, oh my time, okay, I'm okay. So the other thing, um, I had um, invited Brian Peckford to come to Port Alberni. He doesn't live that far away, he's still alive, and he actually wrote the charter that we stand on today. And so um, he did, and I have a, I'm going to give every one of these a little copy. And uh, bless his heart, he talked about, because we uh, did discuss with him about, you know, all these mandates and all this stuff. And what he said was, he's very wise, he said that Section 52 of the Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of the land. And any law that it in, is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is to the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect. And that was powerful. We were really educated with him. He also said that section two, freedom of expression and conscious of religion. These are things, some things that are really being broken right now, you guys. Section two, uh, freedom and assembly and freedom of association. Um, section six, the right to move around through Canada and leave Canada. Section six, the right to pursue a living. Section seven, the right 
to life, liberty, and security of the person. That was that's with the shots and all that, you guys. And then section 15 is the right to um, equality before and under the law, equal benefit and protection of the law without discrimination. Isn't that awesome? So I just thought, I'm here to educate you guys. I'm here to protect you and save everybody as best I can. So I have a copy to give to you, and I have copies of this that he actually signed, and he's awesome. So I still have 53 seconds. I think I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so I'm going to give these. And what right do you there. want to do with this? You can give oh, it to, no. to Tim. Sorry, there's not room for any more speakers. Our really bylaw. must protest. You Having cannot. A, a maximum of 12 minutes to speak. Yep, does we not, have our bylaw allows it does not, four. It we does, have a procedures it bylaw. Does, it does not you, afford the necessary Thank you, sir. time Thank to you. address Thank these you. concerns. At this time, we would ask that anyone who is not medically able to wear a mask, please leave and watch the meeting from home. We have allowed participation, and at this point, we have a requirement to keep members of our council, our staff, and the audience, um, some of whom we do know are immunocompromised. We have a requirement to keep everybody here safe. So we would ask that anybody who is not able to wear a mask leave. And we will- Can I sit outside the door? You absolutely can. Well, that would be lovely. Thank you for limiting the um, discrimination. What about question time? Yeah, question time. Allowed? You're welcome to come back for question period. It's at the end of the meeting. And then you can come back for question You can come back for question period. What time would that be? You'll have to watch the meeting to see, and you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. Are you missing a phone left on the chair right here? No, sorry. Apple? There's been a phone found if anyone. I think it's mine. I think it's mine. Yeah? Can you start it? Thank you. Um, we will now move on to the delegation section of our agenda. And the first delegation we have today is PWL Partnerships Landscape Architects in attendance to provide council with the outcomes of the Connect the Keys Pathway Public Engagement Session. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Minion and council. I feel awkward having people behind me, but I guess that's the way it goes. What a lively meeting it's been so far. This is, um, this is gonna be the fun and games component because it really was a really positive experience. Um, I've gotta admit, I, I find this a little stifling, but not for any reason other than it's cloth. Um, let's see, what I'd like to start this presentation with, and I realize we have a, a time limit, but I just wanna say, um, and I mean this from my heart, that it was an absolute joy working with you as a community. And I've worked with a lot of smaller communities um, in my extensive career. And I can honestly say that um, working with uh, council, the mayor and staff especially was um, a really special experience. Um, Tim Play, Scott Smith, um, Rob Dickinson, and of course Sarah Darling were just a joy to work with. We had a really great time and they were just um, a pleasure. So I say that because I think that really helps in setting the tone for what we're trying to accomplish as a, as a, a group. And um, I think we, we met our goals. Um, so we'll walk through that quickly to give you a sense of what we were asked to do and then what kind of results we got. So it goes without saying that we were brought on board, my colleagues and I who are not able to attend today, to um, help the community have an introduction to the Key to Key initiative. Now I know as a council you um, established this as a goal and way back when in various documents and it came to a point now where we were able to help the, the community in asking those questions. Um, gosh, you've put this as a priority. What do you think? Where would you like to see it go? Uh, what kind of thoughts do you have on this initiative? So the first slide just tells us just that, what we were brought on board to do about a year ago. Where am I pointing this? Somewhere exciting? I might hit the big button instead of the small one, say. What is it with clickers? Oh no, it's got a life of its own. 
Okay, I apologize. <laughs> so it was really important um, in the materials that we presented to the community that the vision was made very clear that this project um, about the multimodal uh, pathway had a variety of goals associated with it. It wasn't simply um, you know, a swath of, of gravel or asphalt to go from A to B. It was primarily and is primarily a project about connecting people with their community. And there's so many amazing things in the community that um, are part of this process. So we have everything from the nodes along the way. And I know people in, during this process had a good chuckle with myself because I get so excited by all the heavy industry. I realize I'm not from here, but I think a lot of people that visit communities um, that have a, uh, a base in, in industry are quite interested into what's going on behind all that you know, noise, smoke, mirrors, whatever it is. And I think that's something that is an opportunity working um, through this process to see how maybe that story can be told. So we were looking at um, how can this path connect between the, um, Victoria Key and Harbor Key and connect people in the community to it. And of course, probably one of the most important things is the waterfront. We heard loud and clear and understandably so that the community wants more access to the waterfront and in a non-motorized way. So places they can go to to enjoy that waterfront um, in, a, in a leisure format. So we were given the initiative um, with a preferred or suggested route. And this, this route um, was the, the route that had the longest leg, shall we say, primarily because the rights of way were in place. There were opportunities for this multimodal pathway to go along, say, um, rail corridors or within uh, public parks uh, or areas that already had um, access to them. So in, in unveiling this to the community, we went through a process of saying, okay, well, if this is the preferred route, um, what are some of the issues with this, with this route? What are some of the opportunities? Um, how can um, this be done in a manner that is phased and that um, people get um, access to it sooner rather than later? So we went through a, quite an exhaustive process um, with staff to get these thoughts online and to get them also out into the public in a variety of ways. As you can see, um, it, this, this year, 2021, 20, was the um, point in the process that we unveiled it to the public. Prior to that, we were doing a lot of uh, work to, to ensure that the alignment made sense, it worked, um, that there were certainly challenges along the way. But we um, unveiled it as, a, as a, um, a group to the community pretty well summer of this year. Um, but prior to that, it was really important to do some of the pre-planning. And the pre-planning was twofold, well, threefold. One was what I said, we, we had to go and actually look at sections of the pathway and say, does this actually work? The second component was meeting with some of the, the large land owners currently. And that's obviously Catalyst, Sand Group, um, certainly the First Nations, uh, two groups that I'll speak to in just a minute. Um, but the idea was to, to, to ensure that these uh, larger organizations, larger landholders, understood the benefits of this to the community and um, were brought along to see how they may be able to participate. Were there opportunities to allow this corridor to go in places that might be adjacent to, or there might be land agreements? These were very preliminary discussions, um, but they went very well, and I think they'll be ongoing as we continue. Um, the second process that's going on at the same time is um, to, uh, to two levels of government, the two First Nations groups and the city um, are embarking upon a process as well um, of discussion and bringing forth some um, volunteers to participate in a process to talk about involvement. That's not something that our group has been involved in, but we're aware that's going on and that's really positive. So as you can see, summer, early fall, um, we brought uh, the suggested path alignment to the public. We started with some pop-ups, both in the community uh, fall fair and also um, at Blair Park. And they were very well attended. Lots of people dropped by and, and uh, had things to add. 
we had um, questionnaires or surveys, uh, both paper version and um, QR codes and suggested people could fill them out online as well. And I have to say again, of a community this size, it was amazing how many people followed up. Far more than any survey I've ever been involved in in the community of this nature. So people are engaged. People are really excited to, to give us their thoughts. And believe me, they came in reams. It was, it was um, really wonderful to read the, the comments. So we took those um, comments and then came back again a second time and I'll just jump forward with that to a second public meeting to say, okay, this is what we heard and what do you think now? Did, did I zoom in or did it get zoomed in? Oh, you were doing it. I thought I had magic powers. I guess not. Um, so as I said, it's really important to, to be aware that we are um, on the unceded territories and that this is a separate process. Um, and it'll be really wonderful with time as this project gets phased to see what kind of opportunities there may be for involvement with the First Nations, whether it's in some form of um, signage, naming, um, the sky's the limit. But it's not something that was part of this initiative, but we are um, obviously very aware of it. Here's our, our partners. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, we are, uh, I had forgot to mention, oh, wow. This is getting better by the moment. <laughs> I'm sure there was a prince that just popped up there. <laughs> um, I forgot to mention uh, both the um, Industrial Heritage Society and Island Corridor Foundation, my bad. Obviously, uh, very important partners um, along the way. And uh, each of these groups have been meeting with both the city and the larger group to uh, express their interests and concerns and such. Um, and they will be part of the process moving forward, Harbor Authority as well. Maybe zoom out of touch or is that okay? Okay. Now there were people here. <laughs> One thing we, we just, I think uh, my two colleagues um, attended these two events and I think they got completely talked out. They were very, very keen, but there were lots of people that, that showed up for both the pop-ups and um, we did get some great feedback. Um, and these people are cut in half, but they are there. There we go, excellent, again. There's our invincible Sarah was there as well. Uh, great turnout um, at the Rec Center. Lots of people uh, came and, and gave us their thoughts and filled out the questionnaires. All of that is available online um, and we'll be doing a summary report as well. So everything that was ever said by anybody is documented. So look at that, this is the numbers of people that gave us feedback and it's, 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 it's really quite noteworthy. But a lot of people came, a lot of people filled it out online and in person. So there, there's no way, and, and I, as I say, I'm based on, on kind of uh, a process I've been involved in for a long time. There's no way anybody could say, well, not many people gave us their thoughts. We got great feedback. And it's a, it's a really says a lot for the community. So one of the questions we asked um, was if we were able to break this preferred route into four sections, kind of four chunks that make sense from the standpoint of construction, um, how they would be built, and it, and it really relates to kind of the conditions that these sections are in. One being uh, Victoria Key, some of that area would already be essentially in place, and other areas would be road right of way. Section two would be through Roger Park, and again, some of those areas exist, would be um, improved upon, um, and then down through the rail corridor, and then the final section four is, is waterfront, and of course, SOMAS lands. So to, to put a little footnote to that, when we started this process, the SOMAS lands um, transfer of ownership, shall we say, was not in place at that point. And therefore, initially, we were talking about the rail corridor through that most of that length and along Harbour Road. But of course, this wonderful process occurred and needless to say, that's where people really showed their interest in the open houses. They said, if we can get waterfront, even if it's a temporary uh, along the edge or you know, obviously permanent eventually, then Yahoo. We were um, quite clear in discussing with people on one-on-one -on -one that for obvious reasons, that's a very large project, the, the Somas Lands project. And it's, um, it's not realistic to think that the permanent path could go along a, a waterfront edge in the short term, because like all 
wonderful waterfronts, it will happen phased and probably paid for by developers. But it goes without saying that when we asked what's your priority, priority four or area four was priority one. Um, that's what people said. If, if we could do, you know, the first phase, we'd love it to be that to which we had the conversation of which I spoke to. So here we have the beloved stats. I won't go through all of them in great detail, but luckily the software that we, that we used, um, your, your um, Let's Talk, um, allows us to get some great information um, on how people would use the path. So needless to say, um, we said, okay, um, if, if you had this path built tomorrow, what would you do? Walking was number one, and I think that uh, makes perfect sense. Cycling, number two, um, and commuting through school for school or, or um, to work uh, was sort of the third or, or in line with the third. Uh, one of the questions was, um, what um, are your priorities for that? Like, what, what, what's important to you? Um, I think you can imagine one of the biggest priorities like, I, if you talk to people was I just want a pleasant, safe route that I can, my kids can be, be on a bike. I'm not worried about um, getting in, in tangles with vehicles. Um, I, don't, I don't fear for my safety, those sorts of things. It's just a, a good neighborhood um, uh, experience and that makes perfect sense. When we ask people, how would you get to this pathway? Um, would you come from your neighborhood? Would you walk down the hill? Would you come from afar. Um, a good portion of people said they might come on foot or by bike, but there was a, a segment that said they would drive there. And that's good to know because when the planning goes into more of a design focus, uh, we'll need to allow for parking in areas that let people bring, you know, three kids bikes, pop them down and then go for a couple of K, um, you know, walk or cycle. How often would you use this path? Well, amazingly enough, a lot of people said very frequently. Uh, we had daily, weekly, a couple times a week. Um, most of the sections that said other were people that um, perhaps weren't in favor of it at all, and they chose other. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the comments in just a minute. Okay. Um, where do you live? Um, and then that, again, that, that reason or that uh, question is uh, related to kind of a distance factor. How far would you be coming to this? And that gives us an idea of um, were these local residents, were these people a little further out? Um, so we would know how, what kind of amenities were, were necessary. And then a, a, a companion one was who's in your household? Um, we had adults, we had families, um, and a few uh, on the seniors. Um, it's important that there'll be facilities for um, all members of the, of the user group. So that might be benches, it may be, it's certainly gonna be lighting. Uh, maybe bike, uh, bike hubs, places you, if you've got a flat tire, that kind of thing. Okay, so it goes without saying it wasn't all rainbows and puppy dogs, because that's just not the way it goes. We did get some people that um, had other things they needed to tell us about, and those were documented. Um, even though uh, the boards did clarify uh, that this was a specific priority and a specific project independent of other things going on in the community. There was certainly um, some conversation around the pool issue and we were aware that that was something that might come up. So these are kind of quotes from some of the people that um, had other things they needed to talk to us about. There was a concern about maintenance. This is, you know, it's great if uh, this path goes through, but heck, some of the things that uh, we have in the community now um, are not that particularly well maintained. How can you guarantee that'll be the case? So all we do is document this. It's not our job to have answers per se. There was certainly a concern about homelessness um, down by the, the rail areas near, um, or just the, off the rail areas near the Catalyst uh, facility. There were a few settlements down there or a few tents. I mean, it's probably a big word to call a settlement. Um, but, you know, concern about that and, and justifiably so. That, that's a sort of a safety concern. So that was voiced. Um, some people asked about the rail infrastructure. Is that going away? No, it's, it's not. I mean, the, 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 the uh, question of the future of the, of the rail corridor and the uh, bringing back that uh, rolling stock is a separate process, but there's nothing that would prohibit that occurring. If we didn't do this project, would we be able to take this money and put it somewhere else? So we clarified again that um, the long-term phased solution for this project will be probably um, allocated with grants and, and the like, uh, depending on if you're successful. 
Um, but this is not something of an either or. Uh, the pool situation, as we know, is a very different one with the regional district. And then lastly um, was the question about safety on some of the major roads. And we did uh, work up sort of in the background some crossing ideas and things to prove that it's, it's quite doable. But people were concerned and, and again, um, that's understandable. So open house two, we came back um, with the responses that, that the community had said, including those bar charts and general comments and, and what you know, people's, um, I guess, passion was, uh, any concerns they might have had, and said anything else you'd like us to know. Um, and we got some, some great sort of further feedback on that. Okay, if we're doing this, then how about uh, these things? Climate change, and that's, that's you know, big on everybody's mind. Uh, any kind of um, amenity or any kind of uh, construction would obviously be meeting and exceeding those elevations, certainly down at the waterfront. Parking, I've discussed that. Electrical vehicle charging stations, that's, those are bigger picture things, but you know, we heard them. Bike repair stations, we do that a lot in other, other communities. Um, making sure that this is planted and, and you know, really reads nicely so it's not just a weed, weed stream thing. And wayfinding signage, so these are you know, all good feel good things. Uh, so that information was all again online, uh, it's all been corroborated. And our final step will be putting it together into a um, sort of mini report uh, back to council and, and mayor um, with that information and um, give you a sense of you know, what the community said, how they feel about it uh, for the next stages. So next steps, this is no surprise to anybody, um, is that the city may choose to move forward depending on a lot of things. And that would be uh, probably with a phase one um, further design and implementation into potentially 2022. Uh, again, based on a variety of things, you do have some funding set aside. Um, but for all to understand that, that, that phase one may or may not be right in the preferred phase one due to a variety of things that we talked about. But um, we do understand, and I think the city understands that that's uh, a, a big priority to get access to the waterfront. So thank you, that's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thanks to your team for all the work that they've done. Um, I heard from a number of people who attended those open houses and, and the fall fair booth and really appreciated just the opportunity to get informed and have their kind of input on the project. But um, a number of people commented on the visual aspect that your team put together and really appreciated uh, being able to see more of a concept of what this path would look like. Mm. Um, and people told me that they had had a hard time kind of understanding what it was before then. So I think it was really helpful for people to be able to see different components of it in this way. Are there questions or comments from Council? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just really want to thank the public for their engagement in this process. I was very pleasant su surprised at the number of people at the first open house and obviously the number of people that completed the survey and did attend the open house and the pop-up tent. So whether your comments are good or bad, we do appreciate you coming out and being engaged in the process. Thank you. Councillor Solda and then Councillor Corbiel. Just, just a quick question on the... I see, I see bike lanes and, of course, pedestrian lanes, but what about the scooters? Would the scooters for seniors? Yes, yeah, so a, a multimodal system is based on a, um, a, a specific width and, and paving structure, and it, it allows for movement in both directions for all forms of non-motorized traffic. Mm -hmm. And it, it even allows motorized in terms of maintenance, but it's not obviously a car-driven thing. So, of course, any kind of pedestrian-oriented movement um, is, is accommodated in this system. And of course, along the routes, there will be like um, resting stations. Exactly. And, and, and that's probably moving forward. One of the things that the process will then ask, where, what, what's the priority? Would you like to look out on nature? Would you like to look out on views? You know, those sorts of things. But that'll be a, a further level of design. As we go on. OK, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for your presentation. So you talked about the preferred route. Was it a preferred route because we had access to the, the right-of-way and the properties? Um, that wasn't the only reason for it. Um, one of the key things for this 
path to be a multimodal pathway is the having the physical space and the grade as well um, in terms of it cannot be a steep uh, pathway so that immediately um, makes certain areas more desirable or more attractive um, and it and obviously what's along the way makes a difference um, because we've heard from people that they prefer certain views and others so there's a variety of things that factor into that but one of the key ones is definitely um, the fact that you're not going to have to purchase great chunks of land to make it happen. And I, I noticed that uh, a few people anyway said they had concerns about crossing busy streets. Yes. And, I, I, and I've made uh, that clear uh, that I, I just, you know, the active transportation guide talks about crossing streets. It talks in particular about four lane streets and it's not desirable and leaves either real or perceived conflicts. And, um, and we're crossing busy streets, four lane streets, three times on this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, in larger communities that is so commonplace now, um, there's always that little, little I don't wanna say, uh, gap between people's acceptance and then it's commonplace. And there was a time in many other communities that I've done work in, Victoria and down the island where, there's a, uh, a real wall that goes up. We can't have that happening in our community. You know, it's gonna slow down traffic. It's gonna be dangerous. It happens with all the appropriate safety measures and then it becomes the norm. And then everybody says, of course, we're gonna do it just like that place there. And, and that's often what happens. So it's, it's a bit of that game of any kind of change people are a little reticent towards. In terms of the safety aspect, it's been really well proven that with the right, um, crossing mechanisms and there's a lot of different solutions out there that it can be very very safe we we looked into uh, where we were at one point going to be crossing um, rail beside the catalyst area and we did a lot of research on different ways that happens and in, in the um, in the european union it's everywhere because there's a lot of surface rail and there's plenty of solutions out there as it turns out we may not be doing that there but that was that situation in terms of uh, crossing at roads and such uh, with pedestrian activated buttons and things um, and even arms going down partial way just to alert people um, I'm confident that it, it wouldn't necessarily be an issue but could you see how it could be a perceived conflict I, I think in the short term there would be a little bit of that perception because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of walking going on in this community now and I think that that's that's what we heard from people is we, we would like a safe route to do just that. And because there isn't a lot of it now, yeah, I would feel unsafe initially uh, in terms of some of the sidewalk conditions and such in town. But that's the whole idea, this is change. And this is a new opportunity for this link to be something people are really proud of. And people will come, people will come and enjoy the way they do the Lockdale Trail in, in uh, um, uh, Saanich and the Galloping Goose in Victoria, very similar. And they cross roads and they cross rail corridors. It's just that, it's that little bit of, and I think you've all seen it, when, before you make a change, everybody's a little dug in. And when the change happens, then it's like, best thing we ever did. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, thank, thank you, you so much, Michelle. We really appreciate you um, providing this update and, and like I said, all your work that you did on this. My pleasure. Um, Tim, can I ask, um, is there direction needed from council on this today? Uh, Mayor, it would be helpful if council directed staff in terms of what you want to see next. Do you, for example, do you want to see a report from the Director of Engineering and Public Works? on um, timeline and, and work plan? Or, um, or, or where do you want to go? Direction would be helpful. Absolutely. Councillor Solda, you're nodding your head. Do you want to make a motion? Sure. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move that um, we see from our um, Director of Engineering a uh, timeline and a report from him on timeline and on. everything else that's needed on that particular piece. A report on timeline and next steps. Yes. Thank you. We work this together. We do. We work best together. Yes, we do. <laughs> Co-written. She reads my usually. mind and she interprets. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none on the motion. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thanks again, Michelle.
Okay, on to our next delegation today the, from the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce. We have the President uh, Bill Collette um, and Director of Operations Anita Sutherland in attendance to speak about McLean Mill. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, City Councillors, and City Staff. My name is Anita Sutherland, and I'm part of the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce and the Director of Operations for the McLean Mill National Historic Site. I am here today to share a story, one of resilience of a local treasure. What I've learned is that many of our locals, oops, looks like I'm going to have some challenges with this too. Um, what I've learned is that many of our locals know of the mill, but they don't truly know its history, nor are they aware of its significance or importance. And can I blame them? No, because that was exactly the situation I was in before I started at the mill. The mill was declared a National Historic Site in 1989 because it's one of the only representations of early forestry encompassing all aspects of the industry. Park is not an accurate description for this site. It's literally an outdoor museum with thousands of artifacts on display. The site is meant to be respected and valued for its significance in telling the story of our past while showcasing what built the foundation of our community as we know it today. Tourists recognize this value. Business 101, understand your target market. And that's the first lesson I learned when I started at McLean Mill. Um, it's imperative to see the historic site, not through my own eyes, not through my own perceptions, but rather through the eyes of the tourists and the visitors that are going to be frequenting the site. The McLean Mill is a marketer's dream. It's a unique destination and one of only a few national historic sites on the island. Its association to forestry and mills is already what Port Alberni is synonymous for. And tourists are, um, pardon me, and tourists are captivated by this one-of-a-kind opportunity to observe our heritage. So why reinvent our brand when it's already firmly established? Rather, let's use that brand to promote an asset we already own that has virtually no direct competition. Travelers are seeking meaningful experiences, particularly outdoors, a distinct advantage that we have at the mill. So let's leverage our historic site and make use of the millions of people that travel through our community each year bound for the West Coast. Port Alberni is not meant to be a second thought on the way to Tofino. It's time that we become the premier destination on that West Coast travel itinerary. McLean Mill has all the makings of a popular tourist attraction. In time, through collaboration with local businesses and partnerships, I believe we can fuel more overnight stays, meals in restaurants, sport rentals, hiking excursions, and the list goes on and on. We are proud of our partnership with the City of Port Alberni and our many stakeholders. We view our role as larger than just operating a historic site. We see it as a catalyst for increased tourism dollars and employment for the greater good of our community. I started McLean Mill when the world was just learning about COVID and only a few weeks later we were in lockdown. So really not the greatest time to start a new job. <laughs> the shift quickly went from creating gift shop, booking international tours, organizing weddings, establishing food service to how do we become relevant to our locals? And how are we going to navigate this global pandemic? So what did we do? We shifted. We changed gears. And we looked at offering outdoor space for locals to come and roam near home where they could explore their lo local history, stretch their legs, get out in nature, and, and maybe feel a bit of normal. So far, we've navigated COVID just fine. But COVID has not been our only obstacle. Events were canceled everywhere, and McLean Mill also you know, was included in that. We were left without the funds to support the refundable deposits from bookings made prior to the Al uh, Alberni Chamber taking over. So not only did our primary means of generating revenue just dry up, but we started in a deficit due to those deposits. And even that was not the most significant challenge. Our number one hurdle has been the outstanding ALR issue, which also forced us to close our camping, which, by the way, conservatively would have yielded us about forty to $50,000 in revenue. Gone. Um, it continues to hamper our potential to secure new rentals and limits our ability to pursue external advertising with the exception of some limited social media. 
you have to know that brides and grooms really love the site when they are willing to take a huge risk and book with us anyway. Um, so I think that says a lot. So despite all this, which would have crippled so many businesses, I believe, we have been fiscally responsible and resourceful without seeking additional funds from the city. I see this most recent chapter of the McLean Mill is one of success and a testament of what it has the potential to become. We've been very active in the last 12 months and applied for and secured several grants, including wage subsidies that allowed us to create employment for a number of our local youth. We were awarded six bikes through a $25,000 federal grant. Our team facilitate a number of larger tours over and above our regular guided tours. We were able to host many COVID safe community events, um, including seeing some things happen with prom that wouldn't have been able to happen otherwise. We had over 14 music in the, event, uh, music in the park events, and we were the ideal location for weddings and larger celebrations of life. We continue to support our mandate of preserving our history through various means. We have invested a lot of time into building positive relationships. There are a lot of passionate voices when it comes to McLean Mill. We all know that. <laughs> and whether it's from volunteers, staff, the public, and everything in between. So we understand that these partnerships are key in ensuring our success. So as for what's to come, well, we have a large grant that we hope to hear about, very exciting on the horizon here, which we hope to hear in the new year about. We have a busy season that's already confirmed for the summer and we're already booking into 2023. I literally take calls and emails every week with interest about things that could be happening at the mill. Um, and we also have continued um, plans for site improvements, which Bill will likely talk about in a few moments, including the caretaker's fence. And then we have coming up this weekend, the Story Walk, which I invite you all to come to. It's hosted or presented by Pacific Care and Pacific Rim Children and Families. And then we have, and I'm very excited, about our Heritage Lighta and the Festival of Trees, which is all in support of the BC Children's Hospital Foundation. And we're um, thrilled to have our sponsor, title sponsor, Robinson Company, on board to help us with that. I'd, I'd love to see you all come in and join and support this wonderful community event just before Christmas time. I'm happy to say that we have just under 700 reservations already made for the event with little advertising and that we've raised over $1,000 from the, from the public. So that's not including our tree sponsors, which would put us well over six to $7,000 already before the event has actually even taken place. I'm proud of what our team has accomplished in the face of so many challenges and with limited resources. Our opportunities are endless. We continue, if we continue to couple our creativity with financial responsibility, I mean, imagine what more we could do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, our CEO, to conclude the presentation. Great, thanks very much, uh, Mayor and Council. And uh, that's a really tough act to follow, isn't it? She's, um, Anita has done an exceptional job at McLean Mill and I'm uh, honored to um, um, be working with her and, uh, and just watching her vision uh, come to fruition. Um, I wanted to speak uh, primarily on, on some of the financial aspects, just so that Council is, is comfortable and satisfied that we are financially responsible. I think last year you remember that we, um, we balanced our books as, as we promised we would, and the same thing for this year. Some highlights, uh, we installed some security cameras, which was quite important. Uh, there was often some challenges in the main driveway, and now we can monitor that and hopefully correct it. Uh, later this month, or actually into December, we are changing the propane system, which will be uh, far more, uh, cash um, sensible. Uh, right now we have large propane tanks uh, located a long distance away from where the propane is actually used and we have to have a lot of uh, uh, propane in, in the tanks in order to uh, 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 use them. So these will be smaller tanks uh, located right beside the building and they will be uh, managed by Alberni District Co-op. So we're going to be shopping local. It's important to us. Um, 
we received an email recently from the city talking about how nice the landscaping is and uh, we're really proud of that we continue to look after that internally ourselves and all of the grounds we took over the pest control uh, there was some pest problems and uh, now we look after that and we've got it in good control and again we're really pleased with the local service for that uh, later this week we expect to see some lighting improvements being done through the site and we're again this this is our investment uh, for city-owned property um, we've initiated discussions with bc wildfire service and fire smarting the whole site i'm pleased to see the relationship that anita and the rest of the team has developed with the ihs it's really important and uh, they've assisted with uh, broom removal from the site she touched on the fact that we'd like to do a fence around uh, the caretaker's place and that is still a primary objective of ours uh, i'd like to see that happen i'm personally looking forward to in the future developing some internal improvements in the grand hall we have some really wonderful ideas anita touched on the grant that we're hoping to hear about that's uh, an accessibility grant and i happened to see a, a, some communication come through on the weekend from somebody who had booked uh, one of the um, spots that anita referred to the, somewhere around the 700 spots and they were asking about accessibility for wheelchairs. So we recognize now that we absolutely need to get that corrected. So we're really optimistic that we'll get that funding. Um, as you know, we collect a heritage fee, 10% on everything. And um, we contributed about $1,800 at, at the six month mark this, this calendar year. And right now the heritage fee um, and the um, donations that we receive uh, are all earmarked for the city. And we're probably looking at close to $8,000 right now, more that is gonna be coming to the city by the end of the year. So, and that number is sure to grow. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the financial aspects that we're working on. And I think we're, I'm very pleased that we are always on top of our game and looking after the finances. I'd like to close just by uh, making one comment from a Chamber of uh, Commerce perspective. Uh, during my time here, the last several years, I've got to work with um, uh, the fellow that was the subject of a recent uh, press release uh, released by the mayor, and that's uh, Mr. Tim Ply. And I just wanna say that it's um, been our honor to work with Tim, um, and it's been, been my honor as well. And it's really nice when you can call a man your friend and you actually admire him as well. So thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Bill and Anita, for the presentation, but um, also just for the passion and dedication that you've brought to this project. Um, I attended a wedding at McLean Mill a few weeks ago, and it was an amazing experience and it's um, so nice to see how far that site has come in terms of being able to host events in a way we can really be proud of as a community. Um, I remember attending an event there a few years ago in the winter and it was freezing cold in the building because the heat probably wasn't on. Um, the site was a mess, you know, the bathrooms were locked and we were there for an event. It was, it was just a bit of a disaster. and. Um, it was such a fantastic experience to, um, to attend the wedding there recently, and um, certainly because of the hard work you guys have done. So thanks for all that you've put into managing this site. It's um, really turning into something we can be proud of and looking forward to seeing more improvements to come. Are there questions or comments from council? Councillor Corbeil. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> uh, Bill or Anita, could you explain how the electric bike program works and if uh, people from the community were interested in trying one out, what they would do? Absolutely, thank you. Should I come up to the, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it was um, a well-received program. I don't have the actual numbers in front of me, but I'm more than happy to send you numbers if you want, because we do have a breakdown of everything. It was well attended. We had uh, everything done through a reservation system, and everything was very COVID compliant so that we could have waivers and everything looked after. Um, it was essentially a program open to seniors. So we, the, it had very specific requirements in terms of how that grant had to operate within the e 
e-bike program. Um, so we opened it up to seniors. Uh, we had some sort of volunteer opportunities within that. Um, as part of the whole program, it's, it really focused around a couple of things. It was to get seniors engaged, um, allowing them to do something potentially outdoors with other seniors in a COVID safe environment. And it also allowed them to um, experience our site. So we were able to give them a little bit of history um, so that we could show them how to use an e-bike. For many people, they'd never stepped on a bike in years. And so it was a little bit terrifying for some people. And we learned quickly that, that we did need to give them an easy, short path to train them on how to use one. Um, so, so we did that by giving them a short tour on site and then they could sort of do some exploring on their, on their own. Um, and then we gave them a little bit of a run through about, you know, this is the, the, the frequently asked questions about e-bikes and this is how you use them and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. And, and what are the plans going forward? So we, um, we've halted activities for now, um, just because of the winter um, and staffing uh, as part of like limited resources. So we'll, we'll be jumping back into things in the new year, probably more sort of February, March when the weather's a bit better, um, safety being ultimately a concern. And, uh, and then we will continue moving that forward. And once, once we get sort of maybe into the summer, we could look at taking those bikes and then wrapping it into a, a bigger program um, um, perhaps something where we're actually able to rent those bikes. Um, so that might be another step in the process so we can use it as another revenue source. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Washington and then Councillor Hager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Bill and Nina, great presentation. Uh, don't sit down yet. Um, <laughs> just a quick question. Last year, my wife and I enjoyed online shopping. Uh, same thing this year? Yes. Or yes, you absolutely can online shop. Um, I wish I had more time to get online presence on there because when we do, that's the thing, there's a correlation. If you have the time and the energy, things happen. And that's why we need resources. I mean, that's why I kind of stand up here and have a plea. We want help from the entire community. That's what it's gonna take to make this happen. Um, because when we do, I, I, in fact, we had online sales the other day because I put a couple of new products on and boom. You know, there we go. We have some online activity, which is excellent. So that's a whole other opportunity that's just waiting to really flourish. But we could come out to the mill and enjoy Absolutely. the gift shop there. And Absolutely. at the end of the chamber office too this year? Yes, or? yes. And we've got lots of new stuff. So it's a new things to see. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Bill and Anita, I just want to thank you for your passion and enthusiasm for the McLean Mill. It's really nice to have people come up here and be so excited about a hidden treasure. And that's really what it is. It's a hidden treasure. And I just want to say that my niece is one of the people who has booked a, a wedding at McLean Mill. Right. She moved here from the mainland. Her and her partner got engaged. And she kind of put out to her family and friends she wanted a rustic, Theme to her wedding, and I said, Try McLean Mill. She went up there, loved it, booked it on the spot. Oh, excellent. So she's excited. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Paulson. While we're handing out kudos um, <laughs> to both of you, thank you for your presentation today. Anita, my wife, and I went out uh, one day and we wanted to have a look at the, um, the final work on the dam. And that's the first chance that we had to meet yourself. And thank you right. very much. It was a pleasant surprise. And that day, I believe it was a dance studio. It was. It was out doing uh, photos. And that's right. It was such a beautiful day. And it was just so nice to see uh, a segment of our population, a younger segment, there at the park. And they were having a blast. Like, they just... They were just goofing. And uh, it, was, it was a really neat experience. Beautiful day. Thank you very much for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, thank, thank you, you so much to both of you for your presentation. We will move on to our final delegation today. We have Dave Grant, I don't see Lisa, um, and Lori Money in, from the Twinning Society. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Councils. Unfortunately, Lisa can't be here. She phoned in and said she wasn't feeling too great. So thank you very much for letting us come. I believe, Council, you have a sort of a copy of my package in front of you. 
I'm going to run through it very quickly, but the most important thing is that I'm here to point out to you this is the 35th year of twinning between Port Alberni and Abishiri, Japan. Before I go any farther, I should tell you at the same time, you are not aware of this, but you and I are sort of relatives because we are part of what's called the Port Alberni International Twinning Society that was formed way back in the beginning in 1986 when this twinning society started. And it has been a very fantastic relationship and friendship between our two cities. I just want to give you a quick outline and bring you to where we want to go at the end. You can, if you take a look, on February the 9th, 1986, the 16 member group of Mayor Trumper and Abishiri signed the original sister agreement. On May 3rd, the first student delegation came to Port Alberni. In 1986, Mayor Ando Coben Kobashi and Mayor Trumper signed the sister seating agreement in Port Alberni. In 1986, the first Port Alberni student delegation went to Abishiri. 1987, the first long-stay Abishiri student came to Port Alberni, and in May 26, 1986, there was a reaffirmation of the relationship between our two cities. Over the years, we had student delegations come and go. We had 19 student delegations from Abishiri, which represents over 400 students, and we had 1,100 delegations go from Port Alberni that represents over 200 state of students. And when you think about the 400 students we had here, every one time we had the presentation here, we finished up with a Sayonara dinner, and Mary Minion was at the last one in 2018. And at the end, the Japanese students give their homestays one of these, which we call a happy coat. So there's 400 happy coats wandering around Port Alberni somewhere, or sitting in somebody's closet. I'm not too sure where. Over those years, we have a lot of things that have occurred. There's a list here. We've had many cultural exchanges back and forth. We have the homestay students. And just a quick thing, students come to town. They come from Tokyo. They come to Alberni. They're jet lagged. We meet them at the uh, Echo Center. They meet their homestay student. They go to the homestay's house. They're there for four or five days. They're pretty antsy when they start off, and you should see them after five days. They are like part of the family. They've enjoyed themselves, had a great time. The gym, gym academy's been involved. The hockey team's been involved. They've had two choirs, one from here and one from Abishiri come. There's the Abishiri totem pole down at, at, at Key. Port Alberni put $18,000 in the Fukushima support when they had their tsunami. Abishiri has a necro center, very identical to ours, but much more elaborate and bigger, I might add. Um, we have the Canadian Garden at the Museum of Northern Peoples, and you might have a picture of it there in front of you. Uh, that is a, a museum you have to go and see, and I would suggest all of you go in, hit Google up, and take a look at this. Man. This is of the Northern Peoples. It's the Ainu, it's the Inuit, it's the Siberian, and it's the First Nations people of British Columbia and Northern Canada. And our Neutralness Group is actually part of that particular package. It is a beautiful building. We have the garden at Royal Arts Center, which the Japanese, which Abishiri, I believe, donated to the city many years ago. We have the totem pole down at the uh, Harbor Key, also commemorating the uh, Mayor Trumper and the uh, Abishiri delegates. And then we have a sister city sign up at the Chamber of Commerce building. Well, so what's happening? Well, right now, Abishiri is celebrating this 35 years and commemorating it. They have an exhibition at Echo Center in Abishiri from the 20th to the 26th. And in that exhibition, they will have culture. They will have things that have gone back and forth. They will have some of the documents we have. And one of the things that they will have, first of all, they'll have a commemorative plaque, which I've seen a picture of. And I'm not can't say how large it is, but it's about this big. It has two clocks in it. One shows the time in Abishiri. The other one shows the time in Port Alberni. And underneath this is 35 years of collaboration between our sisters. And I said, I haven't seen it, but the other thing. I, they're also having a uh, Port Alberni Canada Week. And they have a, they have a uh, Port Alberni fan club, which do a lot of work in Abishiri. The history of the sister student relationship is in this other package that you have. And this is a document which is in, you may have this one, I don't know if you have that one, which is in its third draft. I have seen the complete document. Unfortunately, I couldn't copy all of it because you'd be here all day looking at it. 
we are going to get a copy of this, and you will all get a copy of it too. And it will be, as it is said here, it starts in 1986, goes through to 1920. Oh, pardon me, 2020, pardon me. I'm sorry, I'm 20, getting too old here. And it does everything that's happened between our two cities year by year by year all the way up. I believe there's 28 pages to it. And it'll be great when it's published. And when it comes, which should be soon, it's in draft procedure now, and I understand it will be ready for that week of the December 20 and 26. So mainly I'm here to see how Port Alberni might commemorate this 35-year relationship that we had. First of all, and I think most importantly, our city council and our city to send a letter to the mayor of Abishiri congratulating them on 35 years and at the same time commemorating those 35 years and elaborating on what may have occurred between our communities over those 35 years. I'm also suggesting that we take a look at maybe sometime in 2022 having some kind of a commemorative Abishiri week that would be in the city, which might include uh, a museum piece or some kind like that. And at the same time, the things, there's something that we personally would like to see. You saw the picture of the, uh, of the uh, garden at the Museum of the Northern People. The bottom, the bottom one is the last time we were there. That out, Laurie and I and his wife went there and a whole bunch of other people. That garden is maintained at the museum and it's changed every year. And it's been there for many, many years. We would like to suggest that the city build and establish a commemorative garden down at Harbor Key, somewhere close to where it presently is, where the totem pole and the monuments and some of the other pieces of information that are down there. How that would look, I don't know. But if you want some information or some, some way to put together, we would we'd assist you in whatever way we possibly can. We would also like to have the sister city sign, which is up at the Harbor Key, or pardon me, up at the Chamber of Commerce, move down to the Harbor Key and be part of this package. I envision some kind of a raised garden, something similar to what you have at the end of Johnson Road. It's a high visible place that everybody will see. You go down there throughout the year, no matter what day, there's people all over the place. And that corner is a favorite place for people to stop and look. There was also a suggestion that one of our members took a look and said the sister city website on, this, on the city website needs to be updated. Apparently 2014 was the last time and probably this history of the uh, cities would add to it and that might fulfill what we have been missing for the last five years. The main reason we want to get here too is that we have some historical documents which we wish to present to you. First of all, a little bit of background. These were in a place of prominence in the city hall many, many years ago. The city hall was renovated. Oh, sorry. City hall was renovated, and in the renovation, these were taken downstairs and put into a cardboard box. Cardboard box got wet. Basement had to be cleaned up. People cleaning up came across these and said, well, what should we do with them? Well, let's give them to the Port Alberni sister city. And we have been the custodians of these for many, many years. And I can't think of a more appropriate time to return them to the city of Port Alberni in commemoration of 35 years of sistership. Hold those like this. So there are three of them. The first one is the original one, and incidentally in with it is a photo of Mayor Trumper and Mayor Endo of Abishiri. And it reads... On the occasion of confederation to be a sister ship, we all the citizens of Abishiri and Port Alberni confirm the eternal bonds of friendship and ascertain to fulfill, fulfill these regulations. Signed February 9, 1986, by delegates of Port Alberni and by delegates of Abishiri. And on behalf of Sister City, Mayor Million, we'd like to present this to you. And the city council. Yeah. Don't go away though. I have two more. <laughs> and they are identical, except they look a lot different. This is the reaffirmation. The contents are the same in both of them, so I won't read it twice. This is the reaffirmation document. It's a little bit longer. 
reaffirmation of the twinning accord between Abashiri Hokkaido, Japan, and Port Alberni, British Columbia, Canada. Whereas the city of Abashiri and the city of Port Alberni pledged to cooperate with each other as sister cities, and whereas the citizens of our cities have continued to promote friendship and understanding between our two cultures for a period of 10 years, and whereas it is firmly believed that this accord has and will continue to strengthen the mutual understanding and friendship between our respective citizens, thereby contributing to the goodwill between Japan and Canada and the objective of world peace. We hereby reaffirm this accord, May 26, 1996, Port Alberni, British Columbia. This is the Port Alberni one, is a reaffirmation. And this one, which is a little more elaborate, this is from Abishiri. And the content is identical. So on behalf of our 20 society, we return these to the city of Port Alberni. We hope that you put them up in a place of prominence where they once were. And when people come into the city hall, they can see these and say, hey, we got a sister city here. And it's been going on for 35 years. Mayor Thank you very much for everything. Anyone take a picture? Who's taking it? Conclude. I see you have quotes up here on the wall. You don't have this one up on the wall. And you won't have it because it's only been said once. But I've repeated it many, many times. I had the fortune of being the leader of the first delegation to take the students to Abishiri in 1986. I had 66 kids and 11 adults. And as Lori knows and we know and all the other people know, we got treated like royalty. It was a great time. And at the end of every Sayanura party, which Mary Minnie was at, and she, had, she danced well with the kids, you know, when they're up there doing the happy coats. <laughs> the speaker, one church student has to speak. And this one young lady spoke. She's 12 years old. All these kids were 12 years old. And she was in a, deli in a group of about 600 people. And she commented on this. She said, when we came to Tokyo, they called us aliens. We go to Abishiri, they call us friends. And we still are friends after 35 years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming today. We really appreciate yes. it. And um, we are working on a letter to send um, thanking the city of Abishiri for 35 years of friendship um, and appreciate all of the work that you are doing. And, Councillor, are there any questions or comments before we go? Councillor Paulson. Um, thank you so much for uh, keeping the spirit of uh, the Twinning Cities alive. Thank you. Um, just a personal experience um, through osmosis and through uh, very close involvement with one of the homestay uh, families. We were able to host one of the uh, families from Abashiri, and I will say, once you've made a friend there, you have a lifetime friend. Mm -hmm. And every Christmas, we still exchange uh, small gifts. And um, the, the one particular family, their daughter grew up, and she is a world-class uh, classical pianist. And um, so our relationship with the Amashita family continues to this mm -hmm. day. And we are only a peripheral family, so mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a neat emotional mm -hmm. uh, thing for us. Uh, my you. wife and I and Laurie and his wife, we've been associated with 20 for many years, and we have communications all over the place. We communicate through emails. We, we have Zoom meetings back and forth between the two. Uh, we have a young lady who lives in, in uh, Tokyo. Her name is Miyuki Ichimoto, and she was the first long-term student to come to Port Alberni for 10 months, and she lived with us. And we communicate with her on a regular basis. Yeah. And the people we have met and stayed with we communicate, Lori and his wife communicate with their friends all the time too. And it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. Thank you very much for the comment, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, there's no unfinished business today, so we'll move on to staff reports. Item number one is accounts. Councilor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the, the certification of the Director of Finance dated November 22, 2021 be received and checks numbering 149469 to 149529, inclusive and payments of accounts totaling $864,937.32 be approved. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And item number two from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage. We have award of RFP 020-21, construction manager for the train station. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, per City of Port Alberni purchasing policy, an award of professional services proposals over $50,000 in value, even with prior budget approval, must be approved by Council. So staff recommends that Council award proposal number 20-21, construction manager for the Port Alberni train station, to MKM Projects Limited for $27,500 plus 7% 7 of construction costs. So we figure a total of approximately $50,000, $50,500 with funds coming from the 2021-2022 Capital Plan train station project. Thank you. Are there questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Paulson. The only comment I have is uh, um, it appears to me that this has come in considerably under budget, so perfect. <laughs> uh, so, so, Madam Mayor, just to draw your attention to, uh, on page 17, actually at the bottom, the train station project includes, uh, the budget includes an amount of 46948 for project management. So this would come in slightly, this, this proposal comes in slightly over budget. Oh. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Paulson's enthusiasm. <laughs> I think you still have it. Yeah, still yeah. <laughs> Just want to be transparent. <laughs> Councillor Solda. No. Okay. Councillor Paulson, would you like to read the motion, please? I would like to move that Council for the City of Port Alberni award proposal number twenty two, number zero two zero dash twenty one, construction manager, Port Alberni train station, to MKM Projects Limited in the amount of twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars plus GST and 7% of the construction costs, estimated at $23,000, with funds coming from the 2021-2022 Capital Plan train station project. Thank you, is there a seconder? Second, Seconded by Councilor Washington. Seeing no comments from Council, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item number three from the Director of Finance, we have three stream waste collection agreement, ACRD and Recycle BC. Sorry, Madam Mayor, just before um, our Director of Finance gets underway, if I could just draw to Council's attention the two motions that are on your agenda page and on the screen in front of you, if they could reflect a, a two-year term versus the three-year that's noted in both of them, and so that would change then the date to December 31st, 2023 on both counts. And then council has with them a replacement um, agreement that reflects with the ACRD and the city of Port Alberni. If you could substitute that new document that's beside you, it's basically capturing those date changes and I can call it up on the screen if you prefer, but it's pages 21 to 25. Okay. And then you're adopting the, the correct should you choose to do that. Last comment, staff did not include the Recycle BC contract in your agenda package. The agreement is about 40 plus pages. Happy to share that with council if you feel more comfortable in receiving that in advance of executing the document, but it is their standard Recycle BC agreement with other municipalities that reflect this service. Great, thank you. Andrew. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, today uh, in front of council is the request to, uh, to execute to, or to enter into two agreements with uh, both the Alberni Clayquot Regional District and with uh, Recycle BC. So as you all know, the, uh, the recycling service and organics started on September 13th and it was provided by the city of Port Alberni. And obviously before the ACRD provided the recycling service um, to the city and now we, we are moving from the agreement we had for the transition from, uh, from the ACRD undertaking the, the contract with Recycle BC to the city undertaking that. So now we have an agreement to work with the ACRD as far as the collection 
and, and uh, transfer of the waste from uh, the Alberni Valley landfill down to Chimanus. And then their education component will be transferred to the ACRD to enable them to have a consistent education program throughout the, uh, the valley and, and throughout the ACRD. So with this, uh, we still continue to be within the, the plan for the, uh, the waste service collection, curbside collection uh, cost, and that still remains at 180 with these agreements. And we are asking council support the recommendation. But before I finish up, I'd like to thank the ACRD. And, and we do have Jenny Brunn from the ACRD here today just to support any questions that council might have. And uh, this whole program has uh, seen both organizations work collaboratively and, uh, and, and, and come up with a new program that, that is really diverting waste in the Alberni Valley. So with that, I'll hand it back to council. Thank you very much. Are there comments or questions from council? Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Whose job is it to sort the recyclables? Are we doing it in the city or is the regional still doing that? So we will collect the, the, the uh, recyclable material and uh, transfer it to the ACRD. In the end, the agreement with Recycle BC that we'll have effective January 1st, if Council supports the recommendation, uh, would have Recycle BC sort that recycling at their sorting facilities. Okay. Councillor Paulson. Jenny, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, just I'm on uh, board with Jenny. <laughs> yeah. Just. Maybe you could just give a little overview on um, the success of the program and what it's meant to the landfill and just, um, just for the general public so they can kind of know the reasoning behind this whole switch over. And I'm, I'm happy with it. We have become a recycling it's just weird in our house like but um yeah just maybe a little overview would be great thank you for the opportunity through uh madam mayor uh yes i as andrew had mentioned you know we've had a really collaborative relationship with the city at a staff level we've been very surprised with the success of the program we knew from preliminary survey results that there was support to move forward with a three stream program in the city but we've seen a tremendous participation from the community. It's just been incredible. Um, at the curb only, so not at the landfill because we get a lot of self call as well, but at the curb, we're seeing recycling and diversion rates just through the roof, more than we could have expected. I think a lot of residents really appreciate having the yard waste as well as an option. So we're seeing more than just food waste, right? So we see the diversion of food waste, plus a significant amount of material that was getting illegally dumped at the end of drive, you know, roadways and all sorts of places. So it's a lot of benefit in that regard. Um, as far as achieving some of our solid waste objectives, which is a really big um, strategic priority for the regional district and of course for the city. So we've been looking towards trying to reduce our waste production to about 400 kilograms per capita and divert up to 50%. So within the city boundaries, we're achieving that goal within the first eight weeks. So that's great. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna see that as an overall average, but it is bragging rights for the city of Port Alberni by all imagination. So you can, you can definitely wear that. Thank you, other questions? Okay. Um, I have had so much feedback um, from members of the community who were a little skeptical about the system and how it would work. Um, really appreciating the information that has come out and I think that's been led by the regional district largely although I know our staff has worked together um, but really want to commend you on the communications um, the way that the program was rolled out with the information packet um, that was you know so easy easy to read easy to follow um, the app has had a lot of really fantastic feedback as well I've heard from community members just consistently um, how clear it's been how easy it's been to follow and it's been really interesting to see a question posted online, just you know, maybe on my Facebook page or AV Chatterbox or anywhere else, and um, then very quickly see the regional district's um, sort and go page um, answering that question. So you know, a lot of questions about what you can put in or what you can't put in, and then really quickly seeing responses to that to that question. So it's been really nice to watch that. Um, and I think it just shows how the community will come on board um, when proper information is shared. The only question that um, I have gotten really regularly from the community um, that 
I think still seems to be a little bit of a point of confusion for people, so maybe you could speak to it just for clarity, is, is why people can't use um, compostable plastic. So I've been saying it's a recommendation from other communities, but if you're able to speak at all to that, that would be great. We do have one advantage of not being the first people to implement a system like this, and that is that we get to learn from some of the challenges in other communities. One of the biggest challenges we see are the compostable plastic bags, and that's for a number of reasons. One is that they are not a standard format. So compostable could be uh, a type of biodegradable plastic. It could be that it's made from corn. There's a variation of what that material is. Um, and when since it's something we can't particularly regulate and there's lots of challenges, many communities are just moving to a bagless system because it's very confusing. So one of the challenges is we do have some retailers in town that use that as one of their grocery bag materials. And so unfortunately, those compostable bags are not a great fit. Um, the other thing that you see in practice, and this is the human and trying to manage human behavior, is that you might know very well that the plastic or that the compostable bag you're using and you're putting in there it's certified, you know it's gonna break down. But your neighbors look down the street and they see you doing it, they don't invest the time and energy and they start putting in plastic because there's a small portion of the population that will invest the time and energy to make sure they're using the right products, but there's the majority in the middle that don't. And because of that confusion and the contamination from plastic bags, we've chosen to go with a bagless system. And that is only a compostable bagless system. So you can still use paper bags for liners or anything you like to line your kitchen catcher or your organic spin. And in fact, paper is a good fiber material. So it does help for bulking and for composting. So we do encourage people to try that. And we know it's not easy. We know recycling isn't easy. There is a complexity and we really appreciate everyone's effort to try and do it right. And uh, so, so far it's been good. That is one of the number one questions we've been seeing as well, so. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much to both of you. Um, it's re been really fantastic to see what we're able to achieve when both our governments do work together. And this is a really great example of how future services could potentially go. So thanks for that. Um, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read the motions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I move that council authorize the mayor and corporate officer to enter into a three stream waste collection service agreement with the Alberni Clayquot Regional District for a three year term beginning January. Two year. Two year. A two year term beginning January 1st, 2022, and expiring December 31st, 2023. 2023, <laughs> for the purpose of collecting curbside recycling materials within the city. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Any comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, none opposed. <laughs> Thought somebody was making notes. And further, that council authorized the mayor and the corporate officer to enter into the master services agreement with Recycle BC for a two year term beginning January 1st, 2022, and expiring December 31st, 2023, for the purposes of collecting curbside recycling materials within the city. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Carried. Okay, item number four on our agenda from the Deputy City Clerk. We have the BC Economic Summit Authorized Council Registration. Are there any questions on this? Okay, um, so at this point we do have um, Mayor, Mayor Minions, Councillor Haggard, Councillor Paulson, and Councillor Poon to participate. Um, are there any other members of Council who wanted to? Okay, seeing none. Okay, Councillor Paulson, would you like to read the motion? I'd like to move that Council authorize Mayor Minions and Councillors Haggard, Paulson, and Poon to participate in the annual BC Economic Development Association's BCEDA 2022 BC Economic Summit, Summit Reconciliation and Resiliency, a future for BC, taking place as a hybrid event April 3rd to 5th, 2022, with authorization to include this reimbursement of expenses incurred as per city policy number P6, travel expense policy. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. 
And item number five, also from the deputy city clerk, we have the truck loggers convention authorizing council registration. And I believe at this point we have myself and Councillor Corbeil and Haggard. Were there any other members of council who were able to or wanted to attend? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read this one? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that council authorize Mayor Minions and Councillors Corbeil and Haggard to attend the Truck Loggers Association Convention and Trade Show taking place January 12th, 13th, and 14th, 2022 in Vancouver, BC with authorization to include reimbursement of expenses incurred as per city policy number P6, travel expense policy. Thank you, seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried, none opposed. And bylaws, item number one from the Director of Finance, City of Port Alberni Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Loan Authorization Bylaw number 5038-2021. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so today we have the, uh, the request for council to give the first three readings to the uh, Port Alberni Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Loan Authorization Bylaw. This is to enable the uh, borrowing required to complete the uh, the lagoon project and uh, we brought a, a report to council in September addressing the the uh, total amount needed and that's uh, 8.5 million dollars um, and this is a total project of about uh, 41 million dollars so um, this is for council to consider and uh, and I'll take any questions if there's questions thank you we've talked a lot about this project are there any questions councillor Solda so this is it no more money, right? <laughs> Hopefully, knock on wood. Well, the report, uh, Madam Mayor, that we brought to uh, Council in September is, is the uh, final little bit of project left, and that, that was the estimate that we had at the time. And uh, the Director of Engineering provided uh, his, okay. his consideration of that, and this is the request that, that formed that, that uh, request. So It's just some of the public might have missed that meeting, so I'm just asking for them to... Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Um, and we'll read the motions, but I just want to say that um, this is a project that has spanned um, many councils, you know, many different employees, um, decades, I think, um, and we're <coughs> finally at a point of just about being able to turn the system on. Um, I'm really proud of the work that has been done on this and um, although you know sometimes I think it's easy to look at a project and think 41 million dollars that's an incredible amount um, it's been funded you know almost half by grants um, other municipalities I know that when we when we talked about this in September we had a few examples of municipalities that um, were 70 80 million dollars for um, their system so I think the fact that we have done this um, you know worked really closely with um, with Sashat and Hupachesset First Nations um, that we have done this for a budget that is reasonable um, that we've built a system that is built for growth of the future and not you know what Port Alberni um, has been over the last few decades is something that we should all be really proud of and I know many people in the community have um, have commented on this specific um, project as looking forward to seeing it complete and happy to see what the new system is like for our community. So um, a big thank you to everyone who has been involved. Um, I know it has not been easy to get there, but we are really looking forward to the new system starting up. Councillor Solda, would you like to read the motions? Um, yeah. Let's try that. Madam Mayor, I move that the City of Port Alberni Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Loan Authorization Bylaw Number 5038-2021 be now introduced and read a first time. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. And I'll move that the City of Port Alberni Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Loan Authorization Bylaw Number 5038-2021 be read a second time. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. And I'll move that the City of Port Alberni Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Loan Authorization Bylaw Number 5038-2021 be read a third time. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Any final comments? Seeing none. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. 
Okay, and item number two from the Director of Finance, we have City of Port Alberni Financial Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 5023-1. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, today we are pr providing Council with the opportunity to, uh, to amend the financial plan based on all the resolutions that we've uh, brought forward throughout the year to solidify the, the amended financial plan for the years uh, 2021 to 2025. Also, there was a, uh, a requirement to uh, fund a $30,000 contribution to the Alberni Clayquot uh, Regional District for the Alberni Valley Aquatics uh, Facility that uh, was provided in letter form uh, back in March. Uh, we understood that this would be brought forward to Council to consider to also include and uh, uh, contribute based on, on the study work that's going to be done for the Aquatic Centre in 2021. So, Council has the ability to amend the financial plan per the community charter. Uh, they must do that before the year ends. So this gives us the opportunity to, to provide uh, the three readings at this meeting and then adoption at the final meeting in December. As I mentioned, there's, there's, uh, uh, this is done through the community charter, but there's no tax impact uh, from this uh, bylaw amendment. Uh, everything that's done is done with reserves or funds that were already in place or changing the purpose of, of the use of some funds as we've done in some, in some instances. So with that, I, I give it back to Council to, uh, to have any questions, if there's any. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Madam Mayor. Councilor Solda. It's not a question. I'm just really excited that we're going to do this. We're starting it, and it's, it's excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and it's been fantastic to see the regional district um, lead the pool conversation. It's been nice to have the whole valley at the table while we're having those conversations and looking forward to the public engagement. Mm -hmm. Councillor Haggard, would you mind reading these motions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move that Council authorize staff to amend City of Port Alberni 2021 to 2025 financial plan by law number 5023 by allocating $30,000 to the Alberti Clayquot Regional District's Alberni Valley Aquatics Facility, funding a feasibility study in 2021 with monies to be taken from the city's Parks and Recreation Reserve Fund. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Seeing no comments. All in favor? Carried. None opposed. And if you want to continue. I'd like to move that the City of Port Alberni 2021 to 2025 financial plan amendment bylaw number 5023-1 be introduced and read a first time. Thank you, seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried, none opposed. I'd like to move that the City of Port Alberni 2021 to 2025 financial plan amendment bylaw number 5023-1 be read a second time. Seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. I'd like to move that the City of Port Alberni 2021 to 2025 financial plan amendment bylaw number 5023 1 be read a third time. Seconded by Councillor Solda. Any final comments on this one? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. There's no correspondence for action today, no proclamation, so we'll move on to correspondence for information. Twyla. So uh, on Council's agenda, we have six items of correspondence, and to quickly summarize, we have a letter from BC Crisis Line, who's uh, requesting that you save the Crisis Line, that they're experiencing some challenges. Communication from Wendy Kerr, uh, support for the healthcare workers. Minutes from the Alberni Valley Museum and Heritage Commission. Correspondence from a resident uh, expressing concerns with the development proposed and specifically Bird Street Ponds. Correspondence from the Ministry of Citizen Services regarding 2021 grant in lieu of property tax payment. And from another resident expressing comments about council directions specific to the SOMAS lands and the Connect the Keys. Thank you very much. Are there questions from council? Okay. Um, I have one for S Scott Smith. Um, we have a letter here about the beaver ponds, and I know we had a letter on our last agenda. We also had um, a representative of the SAN group speak at our last meeting. 
Um, and since then, I've just seen a lot of confusion in the public about proper, proper process. Um, when will members of the public be given an opportunity? Um, you know, when will they be given an opportunity to be heard? Um, how should they properly communicate? And when will that process really start? So I think this is a great opportunity if you're able to just highlight kind of what the process is for anyone watching um, so that they know how to make sure that they're, they have an opportunity to have their voice heard. Certainly, so I, I can give a, a high level overview. So the city has received an application for an official community plan and a zoning bylaw amendment um, uh, up on the, which includes uh, three properties, one of which uh, has the two uh, beaver ponds that are referred to quite often locally. As, as council may be aware, it's a substantial process. You know, they're currently proposing about 2,300 dwelling units up there, so a, a, a major, major uh, development application. This will take a significant amount of staff time to review, uh, and this application has not come forward to council yet. You know, there's a number of steps that we will have to go through. There will be a couple uh, of opportunities that the public will have a chance to provide input on. Uh, because it's an amendment to an official community plan, what's called a pre-public hearing public input process must be held. So we will make a determination and work with the applicant about what that means. It's, it's you know, it, it could be that we will require them to have a, a large uh, public open house to engage with the public. That's one possibility. We haven't set that out with them yet. And then eventually, uh, Amending bylaws will have to come forward to council for consideration and a formal public hearing will also be required to be held where members of the public will be able to provide input. In regards to timing, it's a bit uh, tricky because I have been given a verbal indication that they are looking to potentially amend their application. So. If the, you know, they've submitted an application currently, it's, it's as substantial as we know. They're indicating to me, at least verbally at this stage, that they intend to amend their application. So the city will be kind of waiting to see uh, when they do that and then we'll bring this forward. It will still, uh, you know, unless they change it dramatically, it will still require an amendment to the official community planning zoning bylaw. So there will be those opportunities for the public to participate and uh, yeah thank you um, one big point of concern I have heard from people and I don't want to get into too much back and forth about the project specifically because we haven't seen the application yet um, but I've heard a lot of concern that the plans show um, a road drawn on the log train trail um, can you please clarify uh, who owns the log train trail the, the city is the owner of the log train trail. It's, it's not a huge right of way. If memory serves, we own about 12 and a half meters, but the log train trail within city boundaries, outside city boundaries, it's different, but within city boundaries, as shown on this plan, it is owned by the city of Port Alberni. Thank you. And we have not given permission for a road to be, drawn, to no. be placed on it. Okay, I will not ask any more project spe specific questions. Are there any other questions from members of council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for that overview. You're welcome. Any other general correspondence questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, I was struggling to find out where I, where I could fit this in, but uh, uh, having a conversation with a resident on the 4300 block of Michigan Road, um, his question was how do residents go about uh, submitting a petition for street repair? And, uh, our director of engineering is not here, but I just need to know how they would get in line. They've, they've, uh, um, his water line's over 60 years old, and nature's drain is running into his neighbors and his yards, and um, they just like a little bit of an upgrade, but not quite sure of the procedure. So I said I would bring it up at the meeting, but this sounds like a good time as any. Thank you, Tim. Do you want to just comment on that, uh, Madam Mayor? I'm happy to call that. Um, that, that citizen back, if you like, Councillor. Um, and um, it, sometimes, sometimes members of the public have already engaged with staff and then want to bring that to Council, and I'll inform them about what that process is. Thanks. Thank you for that. 
Okay, would somebody like to move receipt of our correspondence for information? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Paulson, seconded by Councillor Washington. All in favor? Carried. And any items councillors would like to highlight from report, reports? Okay, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this morning on our way to in camera, I got a call from our good friend Donna Brett, past councillor and freeman of the city. And she just wanted to remind me that her 16 year old granddaughter, Roxy Manson, is uh, instigating a program, Warm Socks for Warm Hearts, and is collecting new socks um, that uh, will help the Salvation Army and the Alberni Community and Women's Service Society. Uh, the socks can be dropped off at Elite Dance Studio, Boston Pizza, Starbucks Grill, and Walk the Coast. So, on behalf of Mrs. Brett, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Okay. Would somebody like to move receipt of council reports? Moved by Councillor Solda. Seconded by Councillor Corbio. All in favor? Carried. And new business. This is an opportunity for members of council to raise issues as a result of business of the meeting or make notices of motion for our next meeting. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Back in June, we had a big press conference with our friends at the Sand Group, and I was wondering if it would be possible to invite them perhaps to a meeting in January or February to sort of get a progress report on the container shipment, uh, the Hector Road, Colson Mill and Stamp Avenue, just see how things are going. It's just be nice to know, and I get quizzed about it all the time. Yeah, I think we could certainly invite them. We could invite them to speak to everything except for their development, as that has to follow process, but um, Absolutely, we can reach out to them. I think I have a meeting coming up with them in the next week or so. Okay, thank you. And that takes us to question period, which is an opportunity for members of the public to ask questions of mayor and council. Mr. Anderson, come on in. Uh. I have two questions today I'd like to ask, and they, I hope they only require a yes or no answer. I first of all want to congratulate Mr. Pye for moving to probably another endeavor. And my questions are going to be directed to him because I probably this was the only opportunity we'll have to, to do so. And it is related to the outstanding issue of the Kingsway Hotel. I, I bring it forward if you don't mind me mentioning it because I felt over the last two years my credibility at times has been challenged, one by the silence and, and, and the fact that many of the issues were never addressed in a timely fashion. And that's important to me. So you may not understand why I'm asking these questions, but they are relevant. And the first one to Mr. Ply, to yourself, Mayor, I have brought forward the issues relating to the Kingsway, and I thought they were legitimate, fair, and new and issues that needed to be addressed by the public. And I just want to know, through Mr. Ply's version, whether he, t he agrees that uh, my issues were relevant and, ju and justified, are justified. Yes or no? Would Suffice if you want to elaborate, that's fine with me too. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you would like a yes or no answer, but um, really don't get to corral me into a yes or no. And I know that's not your intention, but uh, these are broader, broader matters. Um, this is council's meeting. Um, Mr. Anderson brought questions to council, and as staff, all staff support council and take direction from council. And I don't say that to, to say, hey, it's their fault, not, not, not staff's fault, but really um, in this room, in this meeting, uh, a question period uh, or letters to council, people are asking council for responses. And when council wants information, they'll lean on staff for that. So it's really not my place to say whether that was, um, that belonged in this room or not. It's, Fair, count, it's council's interpretation of that. And I say that Fair with enough. Deep, deepest of respect. Mr. Fair Anderson. enough, I understand. So let me ask the question of council. It's even more important. It's, I wasn't gonna do that today. Do you think my questions and, and my, looking into the issue and bringing them forward and pursuing them, sometimes to more 
and not always get, getting a, a straightforward answers, etc. I'm just asking, do you think my questions in bringing up this concern was a legitimate concern to be brought up? It could be yes or no, and we'll move to the next one. Yes. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate you. My second one, <laughs> and this is directly to Mr. Platt. I met on, I believe it was uh, February 28th with uh, Mayor Minions and with Mr. Ply, and I presented some of my concerns about the Kingsway Hotel. It was a half hour meeting, it didn't take long, there wasn't a lot of discussion, showed some pictures. <laughs> and I had said that I thought it was unfair to bring this to a city council meeting because it wasn't fair to Ms. Poon not to have the opportunity to address in a more private manner the issues, at least some of the issues. Uh, at that point, of course, because if I get a word wrong, you can say yes or no. Uh, the intent was, uh, Mr. Ply had said, well, if it was brought forward at a council meeting, which I also agreed with him, was brought forward at a council meeting, this might imply that the council was pr providing favors to a council member. To that, in those terms, and I just want to ask Mr. Ply, if that's an accurate account of, a reason of, of what was, and, and I had said afterwards, yes, that's why I am here. Is that an accurate account of what took place? As the gist there's, of it. There's context to the, to the yes. matter. I recall the meeting, and um, I recall not being able, the mayor and I not being able to engage you with the responses to the questions you were asking because we didn't feel it was our place to respond to to any member of public about uh, an ongoing enforcement issue for any, so that, that was the, the reason why we weren't able to give you some answers. Um, That's and I recall not saying the question to you though. That, it's not my question. Recall saying to you that, um, that should the matter come to council, it could undermine confidence in, in council among the public. And I know that wasn't your intention. And so uh, that was why I was saying, you know, be cautious bringing it here because it could mislead uh, around um, it, it's not helpful to anybody, to the community, to have the confidence of council undermined wrongly. And yeah. so that's why I was asking you to be mindful of the consequences of bringing that matter forward. Oh, that part. So, so I think we, I, I agree with the meeting. I think we, we have a different, maybe, um, recollection of either what the words were or what the intent of the words were. Well, but basically what I'm saying is that if it was brought to council, that it might imply some of the things you've talked about. That was more ac close to the wording of, of uh, what was said there. It was very brief. Yeah, there was, there was never, and I'll say uh, very clearly, there was never any um, intention to, um, to, to, to stifle your ability to bring matters forward or to ask questions mm -hmm. about counselors. And I think we had a good meeting of the minds in that meeting. I'm, I'm not yeah. suggesting that that was the case. I'm you went where you had to go, I respect that, and we were able to give some answers and we weren't able to give some answers, so uh, we ended up going down a path that none of us wanted to, and we just weren't able to give you the, the resolution that you wanted in you, that meeting. You're not in my head right now on this question, so I have a reason that may not be understood by the rest of you. Okay. What was said in that words, and we're seeing it in different ways, was it wouldn't have been a good idea to bring it forward to a council meeting. As a result, it may not reflect I'm changing the wording again from what was said. It may reflect on the rest of the council. I agree that that might have happened. That's why, and that's why I said that's what I'm doing here. Am I reasonably accurate in what I'm saying? You're reasonably accurate. Thank and we you were very much. I'm able to give you the resolution you wanted there. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Come on forward. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. First time I've spoken here. I'm fairly new to Port Alberni. Um, I've worked, my name is Gail Sheeler. I've worked in for VHA for almost 30 years. I'm also a registered nutritional health coach. And I come to you concerned about the vaccines. And this is the VAERS report. Has anybody had a look at it before? I printed them out, they're in color. You can see the graphs. Um, 
could say a lot. There's a lot of information in here. I'm really, really hoping that you all have a look at it. There is uh, on the page four, they're not numbered, I'm sorry. There's reports by deaths of vaccine types, a difference in, in this vaccine compared to all of the others. There's I'm sorry, I, I do have to ask that you ask a question um, okay. and appreciate that you've provided some information and okay. council will review so it. So my question is, with them rolling out the vaccine very soon for the kids five to 12 that have zero risk with COVID, how can we stand by and watch our children get these injections in our city? When you look at the last page of this, you'll see where they stopped other vaccines, how many cases of deaths. The COVID vaccine is way up. Please look at the last page and you'll see where I'm coming from. Kids are not at risk. Thank you. Thank you. That, that wasn't really a question for council to answer, so. Well, I just want to know how we can stand by and watch this yeah. happen in our city. Thank you. Come on forward. Madam Mayor and Councillors, Castell back again with a question. Um, it, because we're dealing with side effects from these injections, Toronto right now has 417 children with myocarditis. They're having an investigation of their own away from CDC and Health, Can Health Canada has actually got uh, statistics, statistics on, sorry. And, and they are also saying that there's a lot of damage being done. So with you segregating our people in the ice rinks and our sports rinks. We do need rinks, to have no, a question. Coming. I do, it's coming. So they are being separated and parents can't go in to see their kids Plane. I want to ask you all, can you tell me what's in these injections? Can anybody tell me what's in these injections that are going to be placed on these children? Second question, do you know the long-term effects of this? Anybody? It would be really good if you did your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are not regulators of vaccines, you so are. we are when not. You, when you start, no, we are. This is not a back and forth. Um, that is our answer. We are not regulators of a vaccine. You're Appreciate you using your opportunity. Sport ring, and we are taxpayers. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to even ask a question. Uh, I usually shoot from the hip, so I, I wasn't. You know, didn't even follow my paper. I got a little excited there about, you know, I didn't say you were liars. I said you swallowed a lie like many other people. And we're all probably guilty somewhere of, of doing that very thing. My question is, uh, I mentioned before, I'm not vaccinated, but I did get COVID. And I have all the proof that I am fully immune to the COVID virus. I could probably kiss every one of you and you will not be harmed in any way. Guarantee it. This is, his, this is, this is, uh, all the information has come out, so you can find that. My question is, I'm in, in, in a position where I'm not going to take the shot. I don't have a passport. I'm fully immune to it. What, what, are, what is council going to do? Are you going to make a stand for people like me? Not just for me. There's probably hundreds of people in Port Alberni. What are you going to do? Are you going to say something to someone somewhere that, hey, this is very unfair, unjust, uh, we need to follow the science and not follow the politics. So what is the answer? What are you going to do? Thank you for your question. Tim? Madam Mayor, I can say that I've already sent a message to staff and asked about that issue. Is there, is there a provision where somebody who's documented as, as having uh, recovered from COVID can have essentially the equivalency of a passport? And, and when we find that answer, we'll bring it back to council. Do Thank you want you. a few hundred people to come in here? With all the evidence, would that be good enough? Madam no, Mayor, we're not we're not the the weighers of the evidence. We follow the provincial regulation, so um, we'll ask we'll ask what those regulations are. Thank you. That's a pretty easy out. Hi again. <laughs> 
Madam Mayor and Councillors, uh, I do have a question. Okay, that's just all. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> the Emergency Act was rescinded June 30th, 9, uh, 2021. Hence, public health mandates and orders are now have no legal standing. According to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, vaccines are also voluntary. Okay, it is now known that vaccinated people spread the virus as much as non-vaccinated. Vaccinated people are contracting COVID more than unvaccinated people. Port Alberni businesses are hurting more now than ever. Look at all the empty stores. We do have to ask you to get to the question. Yep, and segregating consumers with the health passports only helps to harm them further. Hence, how can you uh, impose the health passport when it is uh, not in the better interest of the Port Alberni businesses? How can you can continue it? And, Thank you for your question. You, know, you can, you have the right to not impose them in the city. So why, why would you continue to do so? and harm the city. Thank you for your question. There's not an answer to that. There's no answer to that? Would you uh, consider uh, thinking about rescinding that, the health passport in the city here? Because you are, are not, you're not mandated to follow, follow those orders. You can say no. There's many cities that have said no. Thank you very much for your questions. So will you consider that? Will you talk about it? Will you discuss it? Council has ongoing conversations about provincial health orders and it is the stance of council that we will follow provincial health orders. It is not our place to overrule a provincial health order. Thank Even you. And we're not gonna answer the same question over and over. Even though they have no, no legal standing. Okay. Come on forward. I'd like to apologize for interrupting earlier, but when I see that there's such a limit imposed and seeing some of these speakers initially being interrupted, I just couldn't hold back. My question is, does this council recognize that these public health measures can be abused for reasons other than public health and safety? There's not a, a, a united answer of council to give on that question. Thank you. And in case abuse, abuse occurs, is the council prepared to explore its capacity to protect the residents of Port Alberni from the abuse? Council is not going to override a provincial health order. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to ask a question today? Um, I have previously vax injured and uh, one of the side effects of my booster when I was in high school is MS and um, we were not informed of that at the time they just lined us all up gave us the shots and I was losing vision in my eye and on and on my stepdaughter received vaccines and after that she ended up with a very rare seizure disorder not the COVID vaccine but a previous one she is no longer allowed to work because she cannot get a vaccine um, due to the fact that it could kill her, according to her doctor, or cause her seizures to happen again. She was just denied entrance into a funeral of her friend. I am not allowed to go into, because for my health, it's not in my best interest. It could kill me. It could make me blind. I don't know. So I'm not going to, none of you can say that um, it's safe for me yet I'm still being denied, kicked out. I can't go into the, the arena that I pay for with my taxes. So my question is, will you reimburse people like me that are being denied access to things that I pay taxes for? And just the ability to participate in Port Alberni as a human being and not a pariah because it is heartbreaking and it's despicable to be treated this way. I have a support group of many women that are crying, they're losing their jobs, they're losing their homes 
because of these mandates. And I want to know if there's going to be some compensation to the people that are being discriminated against, segregated, and treated like crap. Thank you. I'm very sorry for the health challenges that you and your stepdaughter have both had. Um, we do not have a mechanism at this point to reimburse a portion of taxation um, or to tax differently under the community charter. Thank you. Are there any final speakers today? Okay. Cheryl? Come on forward, Cheryl. Oh, I'm feeling bad for you guys. I mean, you all have valid points. I get all that. So this is really sticky. Could you do something to dry it off? It's like, anyways, I have letters because I spoke at the last um, to hand out to everybody correspondence. Because I don't want to say something and not follow up with it, right? That's not professional. But anyways, I do have a question. And uh, whew, my little heart, you guys, a little, little heart on the people. <laughs> Gotta tell you, anyways. I'll try to tame them down for you guys, okay, next time. Anyways, uh, Christmas season, Cheryl McLean. Christmas season's coming. Peace on earth to all men, joy, love, hope. And I wasn't gonna come again. I really don't wanna be here, you guys, just so you know that. But I was this morning looking in the paper on all the things to do. I'll come with a question. Give me one minute. <laughs> I will, I'm prepared. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I was looking through the paper and it really hurt my heart because there's all these rules and so on and so forth creating in the community what's going on here. And um, I won't talk about what the last lady talked about, but um, okay, here's my question. What can you do, because I'm gonna change it up a bit, you guys. What can you do to um, make the community, because I'm all about community, you guys know me, I love the community. Um, and the um, facilities that are public, that we pay taxes to, available to everybody. How about that one? Huh? City Council is not going to override a provincial health order. <laughs> no, okay, so other than that, so if we can come together and we can create this in a different way, other than this illegal order, which it'll work itself through, I'm not concerned about that, but other in the letter that I did for you guys to, to protect you, mumble. Mumble. <laughs> I'll tame him down. But uh, anyway, so my question is um, that when you scan the VAX passes, there's personal information on it. Yeah, there is, and it goes. I know that. So I wrote that in the letter, and you guys need to be aware of that. You can look at them, but other than scanning them. So my question is, can you not scan the VAX passes and people show them because their personal information is on there, and I know that. Can you do that? Thank you, that's a great question. Okay. Um, I am not sure of the answer to that, but our Director of Parks, Recreation, and Heritage can bring back an answer on that. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry for the, you know, the party back here. <laughs> Anyways, carry on, you guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Cheryl. The answer is yes, but Okay, would somebody like to move adjournment? Moved by Councillor Solt. Oh. Sorry, uh, before we move adjournment, um, we are going to, would somebody like to move that we reconvene our in-camera meeting? Moved by Councillor Solda, seconded by Councillor Washington, all in favor? Carried. Assuming now we move adjournment of the regular. Would you like to move adjournment of the regular? Moved by Councillor Solda, seconded by Councillor Paulson, all in favor? Carried, thank you.